G'day YouTube and welcome back to the ASX Portfolio channel. So today we're gonna to be talking about barrier options and we're going to be implementing these in Python. We're gonna come up with a slow function and a fast function. So stay tuned for that. If you're more interested, please just skip ahead. Here we're gonna be talking about the general theory. Barrier options are very different to European options. They're actually path dependent. So we're concerned about where the underlying goes um, over its lifetime uh, with respect to a relative value. And now this value is the um, barrier value and we're going to denote it as H. Now there are two types of barrier options. There's up and out barrier options and down and out barrier options. Now essentially the differences between them is just as you can represent here with this tree. If we have a stock price today at 100, a up and out um, barrier option would be knocked out after that barrier is hit, so this level H. Here we're gonna call that maybe 125. Now if it was a down and out barrier option, it would just be the opposite. So here we might have a level which we choose to be 80, and that would be a down and out option. So what exactly is it though? Well essentially it's pretty unique. We have two different types of monitoring times. So we can either have a monitoring type that is continuously monitored. So here I'm representing that with tau between zero and T. So that means that we're always considering um, where the underlying is with respect to this barrier value um, at all, at all um, time periods. So talking about the discrete time monitoring, we can consider the tree here. And let's picture that this represents a one year option. Now we're starting off with 100. We can see here that we're only monitoring the prices at time 0 0.33, 0 0.66, and then the third time step here, which is the one year. So we could have a barrier, uh, barrier option which is only monitoring discreetly three times over the lifetime of that option. So that's just supposed to give you a bit of an introduction. Let's jump into the mass and how it's different to a European option. So what's the main difference? Well, essentially it's in the end payoff. So let's consider a European put option. So for the European put option, we have a payoff like this. We've got K, which is the strike, minus S, which is representing our, um, our price, and we're going to take the max value of that and zero. So that's our payoff for a European put. But let's now consider a, um, a barrier option where we actually have an up and out put. So what does that mean? We're going to value the same put. So again, the payoff is K minus S, taking the max of that and zero. But there's an indicator condition that we have to apply here. So the indicator condition is for a particular set of values. So what are these values? Well, we need to say, what is the max value for all time periods in our monitoring dates, so tau? And we need to make sure that the um, observation price, so S, um, ST within these time periods, is actually less than our value H. So what we're saying there is we're saying, what is the max price for my monitoring dates of the stock price? And has that been lower than H? If it is the case that it's lower than H, then this is gonna be equal to one and we're going to get the put payoff. If this, is, if this condition hasn't been satisfied, then this indicator function will go to zero and the payoff um, at the end for that barrier option will be zero. Cool, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, for a down and out option, it would be the same. So let's consider that you'd have it on the put again. For the down and out option, you would have min of your monitoring dates, ST greater than H. So hopefully that makes sense. But um, let's move into the implications of our tree and what that means to actually price in this option using the binomial uh, option pricing model. So let's picture this tree. 
Now, the first thing I want you to see is that the end terminal value is going to be known as that, that put option with the indication function, as we've just said. So that's going to be dependent on where our level H is. So for this put option, if level H was 125, then this payoff here, the indicator function would be zero because 133 is less than, is greater than H. So therefore indicator function gets zero and then the payoff at this point will be zero. All these other ones, nodes, are going to be assigned the same value as if it was a normal European put. Now, with the barrier option, we need to take into consideration when our monitoring dates are. So remember here we have a tree and we're representing it in terms of um, I, which is the time, and J, which is the node from the bottom up. So we have two circumstances really. Either we are on a monitoring date and as part of that, on that monitoring date, we have a stock price that is actually greater than or less or equal to H, then the payoff for that, uh, for this particular up and out barrier option is going to be zero. So essentially, if you don't have one of those conditions, you just do the normal expected risk neutral pricing discounted formula that we went through in our uh, general binomial option pricing video. So here, if we don't have a time in this tree that corresponds with our discrete um, monitoring dates or the price is less than H, you just do the normal risk neutral discounted um, price for each node. So essentially what that would mean for this particular example that we've set this at, let's actually say that the level is 120. So if H equals 120, I have an assigned K, so please know that, let's, let's put it way up the board somewhere. But essentially our payoff, I can be certain with our indicator function, is going to be zero for our contract here because for an up and out option, the indicator function, yes, 133 does pass 120, zero. Then when you um, apply this backward induction, then you're going to get a price of zero for the 121 node as well, because that does, does not satisf this, that satisfies this condition, which it's on a monitoring date and it's actually above our H level. So all these other values in the tree at the terminal condition is going to be um, just represented by K minus S and then you will be using the expected risk neutral discount uh, formula to get back to each node to find your price of the option today. So what do you think is gonna be worth more, a barrier option or a European option that we've discussed? Well, the European option does not have any conditioning on its pricing. And um, depending on the spread of our, of our underlying model, um, it, it, the barrier option is going to be, or potentially going to be, constrained. And therefore, the pricing of that is going to be less than or equal to the European option. Now we're on to the Python implementation part of this uh, tutorial. So barrier options with the binomial asset pricing model. Please watch that video on my channel first before doing this. We're going to implement a barrier tree slow and a tree fast using NumPy arrays. So the only dependency you need is to import NumPy. Um, and the generic timing wrapper I have here, we're gonna use this to compare performance between the slow and fast function. So you don't need to import that yourself, just import NumPy. So again, we're going to have the binomial um, tree representation and um, for each node, I and J, we're gonna have the initial stock price tree being set by these up and down parameters. We're not going to cover how to come up with those up and down um, parameters today. We're just going to set those values. Now we will be going through a video um, in the next coming days about how you should parameterize those up and down factors. So take that for granted right now. Um, we also have the contract price being represented at each node, I and J, where of course the, um, the last uh, time value N represents the final payoff function. And we can define this. So for a barrier option, um, this final terminal node um, at TN is actually equal to, well, we're, we're considering here an up and out barrier option, a put option. So we have the put payoff K minus whatever the underlying price is at the time, the max of that is zero, 
but we're, we're multiplying this through by an indicator function. Now an indicator function can take two values, one or zero. Now it's going to take zero if this condition is not satisfied, it's going to take one if this condition is satisfied. So for an up and out option, if the price is below H, then we're going to get one. If it's above that price, then we're gonna get zero. So up and out, if the price is above the H, this is going to be equal to zero payoff. So for all other parts of the nodes, um, I and J, we have two conditions. Either um, the price is gonna be zero because it doesn't satisfy um, the up and out barrier condition. So the price is above H and, it is, and the time that we're considering is part of the monitoring dates. Um, essentially, if, the, if one of those two conditions isn't satisfied, then we're just going to be using the expected um, return of the discounted formula of these contract values at the two nodes. So we've been through the risk neutral pricing um, approach of, of binomial option um, models before. So if you're interested in that, go watch a previous video. Um, here we're going to initialize parameters. We're just using this as the default. Feel free to copy them from my website. But we are going to go into real world applications um, further, further down the track. So here we have an initial, initial stock price, 100K T1. The H is the up and out barrier price of value. I've said that it has 125. We've got the uh, risk-free rate of return and three time steps. Remember, U and D will learn how to set them in following videos. Great, so onto the binomial tree slow implementation. It's slow because we're going to be using for loops through each of the J nodes. So let's define a function. Let's call it barrier tree slow and let's place all of those parameters. K, T, S, O, H, R, N, U, D, and then we need the option type, whether it's a call or a put. Yeah, ops type. Great. And what we need to do is we need to pre-compute some of these values. So the values we need to compute is the DT, so the change each time step, and that's just gonna be T divided by N. The um, actual probability, so the risk neutral probability is gonna be Q, that'll be NumPy exponential, um, the risk free rate times by DT, minus up, divided by up minus down. So the discounted rate is going to be np.exp minus RT, or R times DT. There we go. So moving on, let's initialize the stock prices at the end of the time period. So initialize um, asset prices at maturity. So T, and for that, all we need to do is set a um, empty numpy array, zeros, and that needs to be the dimensions n plus one. So for j in range, zero through to n plus one now, we need to fill up that vector, that numpy array, and that's just gonna be assigned by SO multiplied by U to the power of J times by D to the power of N minus J. And again, that formula is just coming from our representation of the binomial tree here. So once we've initialized our stock prices, we can now consider our option payoff. So for our option payoff, um, we need to option payoff. Let's consider whether it's a call or a put. First, let's make a empty array. So we've got empty array of zeros. Um, for J in range, zero to n plus one again. We're doing the slow implementation for the loops. If the opt type is C, then we've got a call option. So we're going to make this CJ equal to the max of zero or 
sj minus k. Now, otherwise, we'll assume that it's a put, so else, and we'll just switch this around k minus sj. Now, of course, we know that for a barrier option, this is actually, um, it could not be, it might not be the case. We need to check whether our barrier has been exceeded. So we need to check terminal um, condition payoff. So what does that mean? We, meet, we need to go for J in range zero N plus one. We need to check whether our H has been exceeded. So let's calculate S again. We'll just copy that here for each specific J. Then all we need to do is go, if S is greater than or equal to H, then CJ, we're going to replace that value, the payoff with zero. So if H has been exceeded, then make the value, the payoff at the terminal condition equal to zero. Once we've done that, we can now do our backward backward recursion through the tree to work out what the option price is today. So here, all we need to do is go for i, so this is the time steps in NumPy arrange, n minus one. So we're starting from the time period directly before the, um, the final payoff we're going to be taking steps down to minus one with minus one steps. And I have to do this for Python um, because we're not actually going to be taking in this negative one. The last value I want is zero. So 4j in range uh, zero to i plus one. And it's i plus one because at the second last um, stage, we're going to have i being n minus one and that means that it actually has n j nodes. So it's n plus one um, j nodes in terms of the time. So that's why we need the plus one condition there. So we can actually get the, the number of stages. So let's calculate what s is. So again, we can just copy this formula here, so times u to the power of j times by d to the power of n minus j. So once we've worked out what the price is, we're going to condition if s is um, greater than or equal to H, then you guessed it, we have to make um, CJ equal to zero. Now, if it's not, we just go else and CJ is going to be the risk ne neutral discounted expectation. So discounted expectation Q times by C, J plus one, plus one minus Q times C J. Excellent. And all we have to do there is return our option price, which will be the zero value. So if we now um, test this barrier options, all those um, values should be initialized in the previous cell. We have forgotten to do our colon. Don't forget your colons. We have also got another mistake. We haven't actually pressed execute on the NumPy. Remember to get your imports uh, correct. So just making sure we have those parameter values and we get our value for our barrier tree option. Excellent. So now that we've done this implementation, let's move on to how can we speed this up? And we can speed this up using NumPy arrays. So let's copy all this and we're gonna get rid of the for loops. So how are we gonna get rid of the for loops? We can leave the pre-computer values the same, the initialize um, assets, we can now just do this in one step. So how do you do that in one step? Well. We're gonna take the value, we're gonna use NumPy arrays within this computation itself. So we're gonna take D first, we're gonna take that to the power of NP arrange. So we're gonna have a NumPy array in here, we're gonna have N minus one minus one. 
Okay, so we've, we're just creating an array, um, a numpy array of um, n steps down by one each time. So then we're going to multiply this by u and take that to the power of a numpy arrange and we'll get a numpy array back from that from zero to n, so n plus one using one step. So that will immediately cal uh, calculate our, our vector that we want, our numpy array s. So how about c? Well, if the option type, we still want this, if the option type is c, then we want to be calculating a call option. If it's p, then we want a put. So um, I just realized in the previous one, we weren't calculating a put. There we go. So now that we've got this function, um, let's work out what we need to do here. So instead of having max now, we need to use maximum. So NP maximum. So this is gonna compare um, the values of the array to whatever function we say, and we're, we're gonna compare it to zero. So we're gonna go S minus K zero. And for the put, we'll just do the opposite. We're just gonna go K minus S. Great, now for checking the terminal conditions, it's quite simple. We just need to um, use the functionality of having a NumPy array and we can condition on it by indexing. So I'll show, I'll, show you what, I'll show you what I mean. So we can take our C array and because I know that the S has been indexed at the same, um, same place as all of the uh, call or derivative values, then I can condition on S um, with respect to H. So if S at a particular index was greater than or equal to H, at that particular index in the C array, I'm going to make that equal to zero. Job done. So really easy, no, no for loops necessary so far. Now backward recursion through the tree. This changes completely now. So probably just best to delete all of that there. We're still going to be taking um, time steps, going back in time steps. So this is okay here, working our way back through the tree. Uh, starting from the second last um, column. So for first thing we need to do is compute S and um, essentially we can just copy our value for S up here. But instead of N, we're going to have I because the actual column is changing each time. Excellent, so once we've done that, then we calculate C. So C is going to be from uh, zero to I plus one. So we're actually going to calculate this in terms of I plus one. And this is having to happen because we've started from N minus one. So take the discounted expectation as we know in our formula, times by C, um, we're slicing this from one to i plus two. So we're starting from one from the bottom and going all the way up to i plus two. And we're going to add one minus qc. And here we're just gonna be starting from zero, um, which is the default, but I, I'll put it in there for clarity and we'll go I plus one, which is the step down. So now that we've got C, um, we are going to condition C on S, just like we did with the check terminal condition. And we're gonna make any value um, in C where S is greater than H, we're gonna make that index value equal to zero. Now there is one quirk of this function and it's that these arrays need to be the same size arrays and, and essentially right now they won't be because S is going to be decreasing in size and C will be staying the same. So let's decrease C by slicing to minus one, chopping off the top value as we iterate through this, uh, through this array. We don't need it because essentially what we're doing, we're keeping our fixed length array 
and um, these are our terminal values and essentially the important values are just going down to the bottom. So the most important value is gonna be C0 at the bottom and um, the, the top is all the way at the end of the tree. So we start this counting back and this size gets smaller and smaller. So each time we step back, we're just knocking off the top value. Again, if you wanted to save all these values in the tree, that's fair enough. <laughs> we, 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 just import, we just care about one value at the moment and that is the option price. So once you've done this, uh, you will be able to run this. I don't think I changed the function name. And we got the index did not match. Ah, here we go. I need to make C equal to that. And that was the problem that we were having before. So I make that put. So you can see that these two values are the same, irrelevant because we've got a U and, U and D factor that isn't really um, realistic or we're only taking two time steps, but this does show you how you can compute the barrier tree fast and the barrier tree slow. So now we're just gonna compare the times. I've added the wrapper's um, time in there, so we can just execute that. Execute this, and you can see there that it's gonna be giving us the time. By executing this function again, we can see as we increase the nodes that the fast is significantly faster than the slow tree. And you can see for five, uh, for a thousand nodes here, um, it took 0 0.0 seconds compared to 0.68 seconds. Um, I shouldn't have done the slow fast, uh, slow before here, but you can see slow's now taken 19.4 seconds for the 5,000 and it took 1.2 seconds for um, the 5,000 for the fast tree. So hopefully you got a lot of value out of the barrier option uh, pricing methodology today. Stay tuned for the next one because we're gonna be going through American put options and valuing in Python. And then after that, we'll be going through the regular ways that we can define these parameters, U and D, by matching them to the average means and variances of the stochastic process that we're trying to map. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And until next time, see you then.